please talk is a lot concave inequality. Uh, and let me just do a quick, uh, quick review on what it, uh, just a uh, quick definition of what it means, just so that we all have the same notations. So a sequence a1 up to an, we say that it's log concave. If for any k, uh, let's uh, for any k from between one to n, the square of the kth number is greater than the product of the k plus one number and k minus one number. So for example, this sequence here is log concave. Uh, because if you take this number nine, so this number nine here, nine square is equal to nine square is equal to uh, eighty one, which is greater than four times fifteen. So this sequence is log concave. And one important uh, consequence of uh, unimodal of a uh, log concavity is that it implies unimodality. So this means that this sequence will first increases up to a certain point, and then decreases afterwards and then disappear uh, disappear to zero. And uh, one, the most basic example of the log concave sequence is the binomial coefficient. For example, here, let's say that we fix the n and k ranges from 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n. And the sequence a k is the n choose k, the binomial coefficients. And this sequence is log concave because, well, we can simply compute it. You can, you can simply compute this ratio. You do the calculation. And you find out that, oh, this constant is equal to one plus one over k times one plus one over n minus k. And because k is between zero and n, this number is greater than one. That's why it's not concave. And just a little bit of spoiler, but uh, this number here, this uh, one plus one over one plus one over k times one plus one over n minus k, they will come back again in the later in the talk. So it might be a good idea to remember them and put them at the back of our head for now. Another example is the permutations with k inversions, where a k now is the number of permutation of n elements with exactly k inversions, where an inversion of a permutation is a pair i and j, so that i is less than j, but pi i is greater than pi j. So you inverse the order of a permutation. That's why it's called inversion. And already for this sequence, you cannot prove log concavity by direct computation. Because as far as I know, there is no there, there are no explicit formula to compute AK. Instead, what people do is usually that they actually write a formal power series, a power generating function for this sequence. And then they realize that, oh, what a coincidence. This power series turns out to be the Q analog of N factorial. In particular, implies that this polynomial is a product of polynomial is of them the coefficients form a log concave sequence. It's known that uh, log concavity, this property is preserved under product of polynomials, under convolutions. That's how we con that's how we conclude that the original sequence is also log concave. Uh, up till here, is everything clear? Is the pace good? Is the sound quality okay for everybody? If it's good, then uh, feel free to do thumbs up. That's good. Thank you. Okay, so in general, if I uh, if somebody hand you a arbitrary sequence, there is no reason to expect why your sequence to be log, log concave. Let alone, uh, sorry, there's no reason to expect your sequence to be unimodal. Let alone log concave. So if somehow your sequence is not concave, then it must be there for a reason. For example, for the binomial coefficient, let's just say that is by direct computations. For the permutation is there, you can say it's because it's, it's a property that's preserved under products of polynomial. And today, I want to focus on the different reason, on the different combinatorial reason why we see log concavity in Metroid. Okay? And I'm, uh, everyone here is an expert of Metroid, so, but just, just to make sure that we all have the same notations, let me just uh, do a quick recap on what is a Metroid. So a matroid is a ground set. Uh, sorry, it's a, it's a yeah, it's a. It contains of two data, the ground set X and the independent set I, which is a subset of the ground sets, and they need to satisfy two properties that I will mention in the next slide, but just to mix uh just to make sure that we have uh, something concrete in our mind, the two examples the two examples that we use as a running example, is the graphical matroid, where the ground set is the edges of the graph. And an independent set if they, the edges of the graph form a forest. Okay. 
The second hunting example is for realizable metroid. When the ground set is any finite sort of vectors over a finite field F, uh, over field F can be, sorry, can be, can be finite, can be infinite field. And the set of, the, uh, the independent sets are, pardon the pun, the set of linearly independent vectors. Okay. And to be a metroid, the independent set need to satisfy two properties. The first one is called the hereditary property, which means that the subset of independent set is again independent. And uh, in other words, this says that a matroid is an abstract simplicial complex. Okay. The second property is called the exchange property. This says that if you have two, uh, two independent sets, one is uh, smaller than the other in terms of cardinality. In that situation, you can find one element in the larger set, move it to the smaller set, and the resulting set is again independent. So these are two abstract properties of a matroid. And surprisingly, it turns out to be enough to derive log concavity. And in fact, uh, uh, so let me just, uh, in, our later, in our later work, which I will not discuss too much in here, we actually show that these two properties is in a way also necessary. And also necessary to derive uh, some stronger property of log concavity. Okay. Uh, up till here, is everything fine so far? Like is uh, everything so clear? Okay. Okay, and there are many conjectures of uh, log concavity. In fact, many theorems now for log uh, for log concavity in Matroid, like a Mason's uh, like a Rota conjecture that uh, sorry, Rota theorem that I might say. But today I want to focus only on one of them, the Mason's conjecture. Okay, so let I k let this be the number of independent set of size k. And let's let n you fix it as the num uh, as the size of your ground set. Fifty years ago, Mason's conjecture that hmm seems like this sequence i one i two i three up to i n is a log concave sequence. And now, uh, Mason is an ambitious person, so even though back then we still don't know if even the first one is if the first conjecture is true, Mason say that you know what let us just assume so let us just make even stronger conjecture maybe that helps. Let us add a, one, a constant one plus one over k to the right side of the equation. In fact, if, if you're already being ambitious, why not go all the way? Let us add another constant, one plus one over n minus k. And the last one, this is well, uh, this is usually known and previously called the strongest form of the Mason's conjecture. And uh, at this point, some of you might have question. Hmm, Sui Hong. So what is so special about this constant, 1 plus 1 over k times 1 plus 1 over n minus k? Why is it that Mason specifically chose this to be our, uh, to put in the inequality? Well, this is because, uh, remember, uh, some, uh, remember that this constant, the 1 plus 1 over k times 1 plus 1 over n minus k, is the ratio of binomial coefficients. So this means that even after you rescale your inequality by binomial coefficient, that your sequence is still log concave. Okay, is this is usually known as the ultra log concavity in the literature. And one reason why Mason believed that this might be true is that because he observed that, hmm, suppose that my, uh, suppose that my uh, matroid is such that every subset of size k plus one is independent. Then in this case. The i k is equal to n choose k, i k plus one equal to n choose k plus one, i k minus one equal to n choose k minus one, and you have equality on this particular uh, uh, on this inequality. So this means that if the conjecture is true, which we now know is true, then this inequality is tight. That this is the best possible you can get. That you cannot improve anymore. Okay. Well, not really. Actually, the the main goal of this talk is to show that this inequality can be improved slightly better, can slightly further. Okay. But before I uh, before I proceed further, are there any questions? I think this is a good is a good point to stop now and uh, ask some questions if you have. Okay, okay everything is good. Okay, if there are no questions, then let me continue. 
So now, uh, here is a very short, very simple history of Mason's conjecture. Okay. So the first big breakthrough was made in uh, 2015. So 2018 is the journal publication date. This was done by Adi Prasito, uh, Adi Prasito, Hu, and Katz, where they saw that, yes, this sequence is not concave. The Mason's first conjecture is true. And they do it in a very beautiful way. So they took ideas from the algebraic geometry, namely the Hotz theory, and they convert it so that it can be applied to matroid to prove this particular result and also other results. And this idea was pushed even further by her, Schroeder, and Wang in 2018, where they showed that, yes, not only that the first Mason concept is true, even the second one is true. And then the way they do it is that rather than applying the Hotz theory to the number i case directly, they, the idea is instead to apply it to uh, this thing that's called the correlation inequality. And from there, after, uh, if you convert this inequality to these uh, inequalities on i case, magically, the constant one plus one over k falls out at the end of the calculation. Okay. And finally, in 2018, 2020 is the journal publication day. Uh, the, the final Mason's conjecture was proved independently by Anari, Liu, Always, Garan, and Vincent, and also by Brandon and her. Okay. Where they show that, yes, the uh, the uh, this inequality is true. The strongest form of Mason's conjecture is true. And rather than using algebraic geometry, what they did is that they developed a new polynomial theory that they call, uh, so Anari's group called it the strong okay polynomials, and uh, her calls this the Lorentzian polynomials. Okay. And uh, so these three results, uh, uh, among other things, were cited by the International Mathematical Union as, uh, as uh, one of the reasons of the decision to uh, award Junho the Fitz medal just three months ago. Okay. And, okay. Uh, just, and just last year, it was shown by uh, Murai, Nagaoka, and Yazawa that they saw that not only that now we know that the inequality is true, that uh, this strongest form of mass inequality is true, but we also know exactly when inequality occurs, which is if and only if every subset of size chi plus one is independent. So notice that uh, the if condition has already been observed by Mason 50 years ago, but it's only now, it's only last year that we, by, uh, by we, I mean humanity as a whole, that we finally know that yes, that is the only situation for which this inequality is true, uh, for which this inequality is an equality. In any other cases, you actually get strict inequality. So this is a very short, very simplified history of Mason conjecture. And of course, there are many other amazing authors. There are many other amazing works that I do not mention because of time constraint. And in fact, some of them are in the audience. And for that, I sincerely apologize. I hope that you can forgive me for, this, uh, for doing this. Okay. Uh, are there any, uh, before I proceed for the other any questions, feel free to ask questions for now. No, uh, uh, can I continue? Uh, okay, if there are no questions, then let me go back a little bit to the evolution of ideas in the proof of Mason's conjecture. Okay. So we saw that uh, in the first, in the solution to first Mason and second Mason, uh, the proof uses ideas from algebraic geometry. So algebraic geometry is very useful. Of course, they are a very beautiful subject. And it's amazing that this, uh, that ideas from a uh, different field can be applied to prove theorems in combinatorics. However, algebraic geometry can also be a little bit rigid because it has a lot of structure. That's why we see that in the solution to the third Mason's conjecture, rather than using algebraic geometry, they instead, Anari's group and Brandon's groups, develop a new polynomial theory. This is so that the, uh, the approach becomes more flexible so that it can then prove a little bit more, uh, prove more. Okay. And today's talk is about pushing this philosophy as far as possible. We want to develop 
uh, tools they are as combinatorial as possible, as elementary as possible, so that this object can be more flexible, so that this object can prove more. That is our uh, that is our idea. That is our goal. Okay. And the resulting result of following the philosophy of pushing the idea as far as possible is this new tool that we call the combinator atlas. So this new tool can be used among other things to prove log concave inequalities. Okay. And by using that, we have been able to prove new uh, log concave. Uh, sorry, to prove inequalities for matroids. For discrete, uh, so for morphism of matroids, for Stanley Poisson inequality, and for Stanley Poisson inequality. And in fact, in all these three cases, we refine them. We prove a stronger form of the inequalities. And in other situations, such as the discrete polymatroids, the Poisson antimatroids, and Branson gridoids and interval gridoids, we prove completely new block concave inequalities. Okay. And not only that. One advantage of this technique is that it comes, uh, it comes with a, uh, it comes with an automatic way. It comes with a built-in way, a natural way, to find out exactly when equality occurs. So remember that uh, I mentioned before about the result of Morena Gauka Yazawa, where they get the equality for Mises inequality. They get the inequality for Mises inequality, and that was done by uh, at somewhat an ad hoc manner where you, you take some ideas from the heartlessness property, you take ideas from uh, Poincare, uh, the Poincare's inequality and try to convert that to get equality. In this approach, there is no need to do that because the equality follows as a byproduct that every time you can prove log concave inequality, log concave equality also, the equality condition also follows. Okay. And of course, as you see, the list has seven objects. There's no way I can cover all seven of them in one talk. So I, uh, I hope everyone can forgive me if I, if I only focus only on the matroid case okay, for today. And if there's time, then we will try to do maybe even the process inequalities. Uh, up till here, are there any questions? Okay, no question. Okay, so now uh, let us look at the application for matroid. And unfortunately, the general case is a little bit complicated to state. Which is why let us uh, instead try to, uh, let us start with the warm up case first. So let's start with the case of graph, okay, as a warm up case. So for the case of graphical matroid, and let's say that you fix k to be a number of vertices minus two. So there's a result for general k, but let us assume this for b minus 2 for now. Then I, uh, we claim that we can improve the Mises inequality. For 1 plus 1 over n minus k constant here, it can improve to be a new constant, a new explicit constant of 3 over 2. And furthermore, we know equality occurs if and only if that your graph G is a cycle graph. Okay. So, Notice that this is an improvement because you can use the calculation to show that 3 over 2 is always greater than 1 plus 1 over n minus k. So it's a numerical improvement. But I claim that it's also an asymptotic improvement because let's say that the number of edges minus number of vertices goes to infinity. So in the language of uh, uh, algebraic geometry, this number is usually called the genus of the graph. When this number goes to infinity, our bound gives three over two as a lower bound for this ratio, while Mason three can only give one as a lower bound. So that is what I mean by asymptotic improvement and also numerical improvement. Okay. Uh, any questions so far about this inequality? Everything good? Okay. And now, uh, if everything is good, let me, let me continue to general version. For the general version, I claim that the Mason's conject, the Mason's inequality, the factor one plus one over n minus k is not the optimal constant. That the optimal constant is actually this number th that we call the para number of uh, matroid of k minus one. So this number, I will define it uh, later. But let me just say that this number, it depends on the combinatorial structure of, the, of your matroid, okay? So depending on the different matroid, you will get a different constant. And 
suppose uh, suppose that you have no information at all, that you just know that this is a matroid, and uh, you, uh, you, know, you know nothing else. Then in that case, this constant be simply becomes n minus k, that this is the worst case possible, that you get, you get back your original Mason tree. However, if somebody tell you that, oh, Sui Hong, your matroid is, for example, graphical matroid. In that case, this constant can be improved the constant three over two that we saw in the previous slides. Okay. And sometimes this improvement can be very big. Sometimes this improvement can be very small. For example, let us do realizable matroids over the final pair FQ. Q here is a prime power. Then the prior number becomes this constant over here, which as Q goes to infinity, this number uh, is like epsilon close to the one plus one over n minus k. So the improvement for the Riazan matroid is not very big. However, in some other cases, like with Steiner system matroid, which is a generalization of paving matroid, in this situation, this constant actually improve, uh, the improvement goes to infinity as your n and uh, as your n and n minus m goes to infinity. So in this situation, the improvement is very big. Regardless, whether the improvement is big or the improvement is small, I claim that it's always an improvement because we can show by definition that this parallel number is bounded from above by this n minus k plus one. And therefore, our new inequality is always stronger than the Mason's inequality. Uh, up till here, before we proceed to the definition of the parallel number, are there, are there any questions? Everything is good? Okay. Okay, if everything is good, then let me try to define the, okay, let me, uh, let me try to define the constant, the parallel number. So to do this, first, I need to define a uh, equivalence relation on elements of the matroid. So here I say that two elements, X and Y, I say that they are, equal, they are, they are uh, equivalent under this equivalence relation. If the, the, set, the subset of two elements containing X and Y are not independent in your matroid, okay? In the case of graphical matroid, this is the same as saying that uh, given uh, these two edges that I'm given, they are parallel edges, that they share the same endpoints. This relation is almost an equivalence relation. It's actually not an equivalence relation because the condition of transitivity fails whenever you include a loop element. The good news is that, well, whenever a matroid includes element, loop elements, you can always remove them because removing them does not change our results, does not change our, log, uh, our I case, does not change the statement of our results. That's why from now on, we assume that all the matroids are loopless. Okay? So in this case, then yes, your equivalence relation is well-defined. And a parallel class is simply an equivalence class of this relation. Okay. Uh, and now to define uh, the parallel number, I need to define a matroid contraction. So the definition is included, is included here. And in the case of graph, the matroid contraction for given any independent set S, also given any forest S, in this case is the red edges is the one where you contract the edges and then you, uh, and then you glue the endpoints, okay? So for example, if this is your, if it is your original matroid and these edges are your independent sets, then uh, the, the matroid after you do contraction is the matroid over here. And the parallel number of these three edges, the parallel number of S is simply the number of parallel classes after you perform the contraction. So in this case, for example, for these three edges, the parallel number is equal to seven because after contraction, this graph has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It has seven edges, has seven parallel classes. Okay, everything good so far? Uh, I think, do I go, sorry, do I go too fast? Or everybody happy? Okay, and finally, okay, this is the last technical slide for today. So for the parallel number, for any k, first I found all independent set of size k. 
Okay, so for example, here are this, all of the independent set of size one, where the red edges is your independent set. Compute the para number for all of this subset, and then take the tropical sum, and then I mean that take the maximum. That number will be your para number. And I claim that this para number is exactly what appear in your what should be the improvement for Mason tree. It should be what the number that appears in your Mason's inequality. Okay. And this is our first result. This is our improvement to Mason's inequality. Up till here, are there any questions? Maybe can I let me get some water. Okay. Hmm. Okay, if it's happy, let me continue. Okay, so uh, some uh, one question that people can ask, or oh, let me let me go back first. So okay, if there are no questions from audience, then let me ask a question to myself, right? So hmm, Sui Hong. So before you promise about the equality condition, that you say that whenever you can do log concave inequality, you can also do log concave equality. So can you do that for this case? And before we do it for general case, let us again look for some example that when is equality achieved? And it turns out that for this general Mason's inequality, for this, uh, uh, the equality cases very much depend on the value of your parallel number. So now, for one case, let us just say that the parallel number is the largest possible. In this case, this is equal to m minus k plus one. In this situation, Turns out that the equality cases is the one that Mason has predicted, which is when every k plus one subset is independent. But that is not the only equality cases. On the other extreme, when your parallel number is the smallest possible, which in this case is equal to three, then the equality conditions, uh, the, the equality is achieved when your matroid is a graphical matroid and when g, when your graph is a cycle. Those are somewhere in between. Let's say your parallel number is somewhere in between three and m minus k plus one. And in this case, the equality has can at least be achieved by two other posts, sorry, by two other matroids. First one is by realizable matroids over finite field FQ. And this is where your matroid contain every single vectors of dimension n. Okay. And another, another equality uh, uh, cases happens when your matroid comes from the Steiner system matroid. These are at least two other equality cases. And there are potentially, in fact, no, there are definitely many more that I do not list over here. And from here, you can see that, and some of you might see that, hmm, see how there are so many different equality cases. May, maybe it's still possible to somehow unify them all, to somehow uh, characterize, to explain why all these different factors can achieve log concave equality. And the answer is, here it is. Here is the equality condition for the, uh, here is the equality condition for the, what it, uh, for this uh, stronger Mason's inequality. And the condition written here is uh, unfortunately a bit complicated, but I like to think about it in comparison to the isoperimetric inequality. So remember that, uh, so we, as uh, uh, isoperimetric inequality. This is inequality in geometry. where suppose that I hand you an object. I hand you an object where, uh, where it's measurable. So the volume is fixed. Uh, so the volume is well-defined. And let us assume that the volume is equal to one. Now, if you want to maximize the, if you want to maximize the surface area of this object, the maximizer, actually happens when this object is the is the is the Euclidean ball. Okay. And what does Euclidean ball mean in terms of uh, like philosophically? And what does it mean in terms of uh, in terms of uh, geometry? Well, Euclidean ball is an object that's as symmetric as possible. That when it, from every angle you look at it, they all look the same. And it turns out that to say some object is as symmetric as possible in the world of discrete matroid, it's the same as saying that for every element set of size k minus one, so these are like your uh, yeah, co-dimension one and co-dimension two condition, the matroid after you do the first contraction, you do the contraction by this 
uh, independent set should have all the same number of paragraph classes. Or if this graph, they all have the same number of edges. And furthermore, every paragraph class of this uh, of this uh, uh, of this contracted matroid again have the same size. So these are you can think of it as the co-dimensional co-dimensional condition and co-dimensional two condition of your abstract simple serial complex, and that turns out to be enough to get your equality for your Mason span uh, for the main, for this uh, log integer inequality. Up till here, are there any questions? Okay, let me maybe. Okay. Okay, if there are no questions, then actually we might be able to. Mm. Okay, so I know, uh, in fact, maybe uh, if there are, I think that uh, if there are no questions, then actually let me just do one more application. Okay. Uh, yes, a question, Ahmed? So sweet, I was I was wondering whether we're gonna see the definition of a combinatorial atlas, like uh, what uh, the yes. machinery that you use behind this all these improvements. Okay, of course, yes, that uh, that is a very good. Let, let, let me let, let us do that now. Okay. So here is the idea for combinatorial atlas. The input is the following object, which is a psychic digraph. So the graph has an arrows, and every Every object, every sorry, every vertex is assisted with a symmetric matrix M with non-negative entries, and also a vector G and H, also non-negative entries, just for simplicity. We can actually do it for slightly more general, but let us uh, just use the generality for now. So this is an example of an atlas. So this is a graph, a cyclic, okay, and because it's an atlas, it means that every vertex, if you zoom in. You will see that it has a matrix, a three, uh, in this case, a three times three matrix, and two vectors associated to it. And of course, uh, if, uh, sorry, in this example, my choice of matrix and vectors are arbitrary. Okay, I just make them up. But if you want to use this atlas to prove log negative inequality, then of course, these matrix need to be special. They somehow need to come from some combinatorial objects. For example, suppose that I try to prove the, the, Mason's inequality, the Mason's inequality that we saw just now. And let me just say that we try to prove it for this matroid with exactly three elements, okay? Just for simplicity. In this case, the matroid, uh, sorry, the atlas has three levels. The top vertex is always labeled by the empty set. The second label, they are all elements of size, uh, they are all the elements of the matroid. So the elements of X, so A, B, C, plus an extra element, which we need to add for some uh, technical reason. That is actually one of the thing that allow us to do the log concavity. And for the second level, these are all of the subset of size two for your matroid. Okay, plus, or maybe subset of size one plus the special element. And as this is an atlas, this means that every single vertex must be associated with some, uh, with some matrix. And in this case, the matrix, all of them comes from, the entries come from counting the number of independent sets satisfying certain properties. In general, the number, the, uh, the matrix for element A and B, they are, the, they are equal to the number of independent sets of size K plus one, containing an element A and containing element B. And if, you, uh, if you, it's A and a special element, then rather than counting element of size K plus one, you count element of size K. And if both of them are special element, then you count the element of the size K minus one, okay? So this is how you get from the matroid problem to the atlas problem. And of course, in general, uh, Rather than, uh, so rather than trying to prove the log concavity, I claim that what we should do is that we should try to prove this stronger property that we call the hyperbolic inequality. That's what I mean by that. Okay. So we say that a point, uh, sorry, uh, a matrix M has hyperbolic inequality property if for any vector X and Y, and here let's just assume that one of them is at least non-negative, the in the bilinear product of x and y with respect to m square is bounded from below 
by the inner product of m, uh, inner product of x with respect to m, and inner product of y with respect to m. Okay. And one useful or maybe one important property of this uh, of this inequality is that it also has a spectral meaning, which is saying that this matrix M has at most one positive eigenvalue. Okay. And this parallel property is actually very useful because it allows us to actually, uh, so actually in our proof, a lot of time we actually move on. It's like sometimes we'll use this uh, linear algebraic version. Sometimes we need to use the spectral version and we need to interchange them all the time, okay? To get our results. And one very important remark that I want to make here is that we are not the first people, that we are not the first people to realize that this property is important in proving log concavity. In fact, you can say, uh, you can argue that this date back all the way to maybe Alexander Fanchel when they prove this, uh, uh, when they prove this Alexander Fanchel inequality, and also maybe back to Kowalski and uh, that, uh, that back to Hobbes theory. And just very recently, it's, it has already been used by the Brandon and her in uh, in the definition of Lagrangian polynomials. Well, in our case, our inspiration actually come from this uh, new proof of Alexander Fanchel inequality by the Sanford and Van Handel, where they call it the Bochner method. Okay, and there's also the recent paper by uh, John. Uh, Brandon and Lick, where they actually use this, uh, this Lagrangian polynomial to actually prove the like the, the, the conjecture that Ahmed said in the beginning of the talk, the Rota, to give another the, a new proof of the Rota, Heron Rota Wells conjecture. Yes. Okay. So up till here, are there any questions? Um, so we can you go back to the uh, the where you have the diagram of a acyclic digraph. Uh -huh. So here uh, you are assigning to each element a matrix or assigning a matrix to the whole digraph? Uh, assigning a matrix to every, uh, to every vertex. So, okay, so yeah, so this one is the matrix only for the top vertex. If you are doing it for the next element, let's say that for, for this one, the element, the, uh, element D, then on top of you only your, your counting number in the pattern set, on top of containing uh, the element A and B, they also need to contain element C. Okay. Okay. Yes. So some kind of covering. Right? Okay. I understand. Something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So the idea is really to do induction to it uh, from uh, that uh, from simple object, you can induct it up to the more complete object. And of course, the important thing is that how exactly the induction works. Okay. And, uh, but before, uh, yeah. And let me just uh, make clear that. Remember that our, our promise is to prove log concave inequality. So how is it that hyperbolic inequality actually helps? And the idea is as follows. When, it, when you build this atlas, remember, we do not do it in any arbitrary way. We do it in a very, very, very specific way, which is that, uh, and actually, in fact, we do it in such a way that your number ak, ak plus one, and ak minus one in your sequence of log in your log concave sequence, you do it so that it can be written as the inner product of the uh, of m, g, and h, where these three is the matrix and the vectors that are associated to the top vertex, to the top vertex of an atlas. Okay. And now once you have this, then you actually have the hyperbolic inequality immediately implies log concave inequality, right? And, surprising, and surprisingly, actually this, uh, maybe actually not surprising, actually this is actually very common in mathematics, where somehow when you try to prove stronger result, at the end to prove stronger properties, the proof actually become easier, right? Because now you have more structure that allows you to do easier induction. Okay? The induction becomes stronger, okay? Okay, and now, of course, not all atlas have these properties. That all, not all atlas have this hyperbolic inequality property. In fact, most of them don't. So if you want to have hyperbolic inequality property, your atlas needs to be very, very, very special. Fortunately for us uh, is that we, uh, when we went through the, well, when we gone through this result, we have pinpointed exactly the three conditions that you need for your atlas to have these hyperbolic inequality properties. So let me, uh, let me just explain these two conditions very quickly. 
The first condition is called the irreducibility condition. This condition is also the easiest to check. So, um, uh, so for any matrix M, you you want this is that you want this matrix to be irreducible after you restrict to the support, which means that you remove rows and columns of size zero. Yeah, and you also want your vectors, all of them, to be a positive vector. Okay, so this is a uh, yeah. And in the case of matroid, the vector H, uh, which also I forgot to define, but this is a vector, everything is equal to one for the matroid case. So this condition is trivial. And for the matrix M, this condition is the same as saying that the base exchange graph is connected. So this condition is the same, uh, is actually a condition implied by the exchange property. Okay. And the second condition is a little bit more complicated. So this is a condition in terms of the linear algebra, which says that for every edges in your atlas, there's a map PI, which is a, like endomorphism. You can think of it as a change of basis, such that the I coordinate of a matrix can be written as the inner product of a smaller matrix, of a matrix of the children, which is given by this MI. So this is just some condition so that you can apply induction. And for matroid, in the case of matroid, this condition is actually also trivial. It simply says that given a number of independent set of size k times k, you can, this is equal to the sum of all of the independent set containing specific element EI. And notice that these two are equal because uh, for any independent set that appears in the right hand side, uh, left hand side, it appears exactly k. Uh, sorry, it appears exactly k times because you know you, uh, you count it once when element e one, count it second time when element e two, you count it uh, the k time for element e k. Okay, so this condition is trivial to check also for matroid. The third condition is called the subdivergence condition. This condition is actually, uh, it says that, uh, it's a bit complicated, but it basically says that the sum of inner product of the any vector x with, uh, with respect to the, the matrix mi of the children, of the children of vertex, is bounded from below by the inner product of the same, same vector x, but apply to the matrix m of the parent vertex. And this condition, uh, let me just say that it's usually it's the hardest one to check. But the good news is that for matroid, this condition is actually is actually pretty simple. It simplifies to checking the hereditary property of the uh, to checking that the matroid satisfy hereditary property with all matroid satisfied. And let me actually make a comment here. Oh, I, uh, which is I what which is I forget to say for the in the in the beginning. But this Lorentzian polynomial that I uh, discussed before, that the embedded by Biden and her, it can actually be shown that it's actually a special case. It's a special case of the complementary atlas. And in fact, Lorentzian polynomial, in that case, this inequality is an equality. Okay? In particular, this is also an equality for matroid. But uh, if you want to do a more general application, if you want to go for gridoids, if you want to go for POSET, these inequalities need to be straight. And that is actually, this modification is one of the things, among other things, that allow us to go further, that allow us to go to, to, to prove everything that's a, you can say like a direct, the direct version of all these results. Okay. And uh, yeah, I think, do I say? It? Yeah, okay. Up till here, are there any questions? Uh, Sui Hong, I, uh, yes. I have a question. Um, I mean, if you have a Lorentzian polynomial, what, what are the M's here? I mean, how, how are these matrices related to Lorentzian polynomials? I mean, are you, yeah, go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. How are these matrix related to Lorentzian polynomials? So in the case of Lorentzian polynomial, this matrix would be the Hessian matrix. Okay, uh, and, in, that, in, that, in that case, yes. And, and so, but you have one, you have a matrix for every vertex. I, I, I don't quite. Uh, so you have, exactly, so I've, uh, okay. Let me go back to the to the to the slide. Yes. Yeah. So in the case of Lorentzian polynomial, the atlas is the one. Uh, 
it, uh, they are like the coordinates that you do der derivatives. Because logic polynomial is that uh, not only that the Hessian for the matrix is a log, uh, is the uh, is a Lorentzian, also that the derivative of the the derivative of polynomial still have the same property. So this uh, so this your atlas is like a it record like how many times have you done the derivatives on which direction? I hope that answers your question, Chris. Uh huh. So okay. So sorry. So you have you have one. F in terms of variables A, B, C, and then at each level you take the the eighth derivative, the eighth derivative, and, and so exactly. on. Exactly. In, in the Hessians. Okay, and so exactly. your atlas method is saying there doesn't necessarily have to be one single function. You just assign matrices to each. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And in fact, uh, uh, the thing is that actually uh, the, the derivative, uh, if you can see that when you do the derivative, there's this important property that the derivative commutative dx dy is equal to dy dx. But if you do this for post set, for example, this commutativity is false, that you cannot use it anymore. So that's why we actually need to do the more general case to do things for post sets, for example, or for gridoids, because those, all the commutativity there goes uh, disappear. But yeah, thanks for the very good question. Thank you. Any other question? OK, and uh, if there are no questions, then let me, let me explain how that once you have this three property, uh, your hyperbolic inequality actually follows immediately or actually follows like very uh, automatically. And the idea is that it turns out that uh, hyperbolic inequality is in a way, it spreads like COVID, right? With COVID, like if you're usually, uh, usually how adults get a COVID is that Okay, you have children, they go to the health, uh, they go to the uh, daycare, they, they all get COVID, they come back home, and then you get COVID from their children. The same with this high world inequality. Suppose that every child vertex of your uh, class have a high inequality property. Then the parent vertex also get it, uh, will also get it immediately. Okay, here is an illustration. So first is that suppose that all of the vertices at the bottom, the one that I, I give the color blue, they all already have high volume inequality property. This is usually very easy to check. And uh, because you bring the atlas in such a way that the bottom elements are usually the one that is the, they are usually the simplest case. In the case of matroid, the bottom elements here, they are all the matroids of size equal to three. For which, in this case, the log of inequality is trivial. And once you have that, you are done. Because by this uh, bottom top principle, which I claim, this property spreads, spreads, spreads like COVID. It spreads to the whole graph. In particular, remember that your log of follows from the hyperbolic inequality of one of the top vertex. So now that this top vertex got the COVID, I mean, I mean sorry, got the hyperbolic inequality, now you get a log of that you are done. Yay! Up till here. Are there any questions? Like, is, I hope the illustration is clear. Okay. Okay. And now, okay, if the if everybody's happy about the inequality case, well, let uh let me also done what I promise. Because remember, I promised that not only that we can do inequalities now, we can also do equality case. So how do we do that? Well, recall that because of how we convert the log the log concave sequence. To our, uh, uh, to our atlas objects, having a log concave equality is the same as saying that you have this following hyperbolic equality. Okay? And just like how in the, uh, before we have this uh, bottom to top principle for how the COVID spread, here we also have a similar property, but rather than spreading from the parent, sorry, from the children parent, now the equality spread from the parent to the children. For example, remember that saying that there's a log concave equality is the saying that one of these vertex at the top has hyperbolic equality, right? Now, this property spread, 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 and it cover, notice uh, it covers some button vertices, but not all of the vertices. This is in fact a feature. This is not a bug. Our equality conditions that tell us that exactly when equality occurs actually comes from comparing which vertices the uh, which vertices get this equality property 
risk factors do not get the equality property. And that is that difference is exactly after you do the calculation, after you do the combinatorial interpretation, exactly what gives you the equality conditions. Okay. Uh, uh, any question? Okay, any question so far before we go for before actually we just uh, I just say something else as a concluding remarks. No. Okay. Okay. So uh, in that uh, so today I only show proof for the matroid case because of time constraint, but let me just say that our result our method is actually very general. That in our paper we actually show that it can be applied to at least seven other objects: matroid, matrix of matroid. Poly matroids, Stanley's process inequality, anti matroids, Branson gridoids, and interval gridoids. And uh, in fact, we believe that it can be applied to more objects, just that the paper is only 70 pages. And if we keep going, then it will be 200 pages paper. And it will, it will not be a paper anymore, it will be a book. So that's why we stop there. And in fact, we realized that after we finish our paper, that turns out that this paper is a can be a bit iffy debating. It's 71 pages, right? So people can, it's, it's a bit time investment to try to read it. That's why in order to make things, uh, in order to help people, we actually wrote an expository, exp, expository version of the paper, which is 28 pages, which is shorter. And the technique also is uh, more, uh, it's actually a bit weaker than the one in this paper. We weaken the technique so that it's more accessible. But on the other hand, it's also, uh, 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 it's also still enough. It's still enough to prove Mason tree. It's not enough to prove our generalization, but enough to prove Mason tree. Okay. And my suggestion is that if anybody's interested to learn how to uh, learn this technique, uh, I would suggest to start from the sorted paper first. And if you are interested, uh, go for the longer paper or send me an email, whichever you prefer. Okay. And I think that's all I want to say for today. Thank you very much for listening. Let's let's thank the speaker. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Sweep, for such a nice talk. Any questions from the audience?